this is a holy moment that the Lord would bring our full attention and focus to the things that he would speak to us today. We have gathered for such a time as this to hear the word of the Lord. That your heart would be open to receive whatever he would place there today. Having ears to hear what the Spirit would say, that we would not just hear words, but that we would receive instruction. That we would give ourselves to the obedience of this word. For heaven and earth will pass away, but this word lives forever. It is quick and it is powerful, sharper than a double-edged sword, dividing the asunder of the heart and mind, even to the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of every heart. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the grace of the Holy Spirit that is here with us today. I thank you, God, for the privilege that we have, Lord, of having received your word and hearing instruction. I pray that, Holy Spirit, today you would move in this place in such a way that hearts would be open and ears attentive, O oh God, to hear every word that you would speak to us. God, I pray that the Holy Spirit would bring forth the unction and the anointing, that you would hide your servant behind the cross, that I would just be a mouthpiece and an oracle that, God, that you would speak through to every heart, young and old. That, God, that you would bring forth, oh God, a change in our, in our circumstance, in our situation. That, God, that, Lord, though we may be tarrying and waiting, oh God, in situations of difficulty, though we may be battling, God, situations and circumstances that seem beyond our control, there is a God in heaven who knows our name. He knows where we are at. He knows what we're experiencing. He knows the cries of our heart. Be open to us, Lord, as our hearts would be open to you. Let the windows of heaven, God, this day be poured out upon every soul and every person that is here today to hear the words of the Lord. And God, be transformed and changed through the renewing of our hearts and the renewing of our minds. In Christ Jesus, we pray all of these things in his wonderful and glorious name. And let's give him praise. Hallelujah. Let's give him a clap of praise this morning. Jesus, you're worthy. You are worthy this morning. Thank you, almighty God, that you are the risen one and soon returning Savior. Hallelujah. Remain standing and take your word out with me. And let's read this morning. Open to Luke's gospel in the 12th chapter and remain standing in honor of God's word. Luke's gospel, chapter 12. If you were here last Sunday, you heard the message about the wise, the parable rather, about the wise and the foolish virgins. Today we're going to look at the faithful and the unfaithful servant. The faithful and the unfaithful servant. Verse 35 reads, Let your waist be girded and your lamps burning. What a picture. This is a picture, like we heard last week, of a servant. In those days, they would wear a, a, a cloak. They would have a long garment. And those that would be in service, when you would... Uh, Gird up your loins would be to take up your tunic and tuck it in your belt. That's what it's saying. Be prepared for action. Gird your loins. Let your waist be girded and your lamps on fire. Verse 36. And you yourselves be like men who wait for their master when he will return from the wedding and when he comes and knocks that they may open to him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the master, when he comes, will find watching. Everyone say watching. Assuredly, I say to you that he will gird himself and have them sit down to eat and will come 
and serve them. Verse 38. And if he should come in the second watch or come in the third watch, he will find them so. Blessed are those servants. Everyone say blessed. Verse 39, but know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Verse 40, therefore, be also ready. Everyone say ready. ready. Be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at the hour you do not expect. Peter said to him, Lord, are you talking to us? That's my paraphrase. Lord, are you saying this to us or are you saying it to everyone? Verse 42, and the Lord said, who then is a faithful and a wise steward whom his master will make ruler over his household to give them their portion of food in their season? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly, I say to you, he will make him ruler over everything that he has. But if that servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming and begins to beat the male and female servants and begins to eat and to, be, and to drink and to be drunk, the master of that servant will come on that day when he is not looking for him and at an hour when he is not aware and will cut him in two and appoint him a portion with of the unbeliever. And then the servant who knew his master's will and did not prepare himself to do according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes. But he who did not know yet committed things deserving of stripes shall be beaten with few. For everyone, everyone say everyone. For everyone to whom much is given, from him much is required. And to whom much has been committed, of him they will ask the more. May God bless his word to us here this morning. In Jesus' name, Lord, we have heard your word. Now we pray, Spirit, direct it to our hearts. But we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Jesus, in this parable this morning, is calling us to attention, church. He's calling us to be watchful and ready. This is what we heard last Sunday in the parable in Matthew chapter 25, through the parable of the the wise and the foolish virgins. And again, Jesus is teaching the multitudes, and he's saying things very similar, but differently than he said them before. And so Jesus is stressing for us today in this parable the importance for those of us who are servants of the living God to be faithful and to be watchful and to be ready for his return. In this pa passage of Scripture in Luke chapter 12, if you take the time to go home, Pastor Solomon had shared much of this in, in previous messages, but in each of, of this chapter, there are four warnings that Jesus gives to those in that day when he was sharing this message. The first warning is that in Luke chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, and he says this, Beware of hypocrisy. He was speaking to those of the religious leaders, specifically the Pharisees of those days, that these Pharisees were religious people who acted as though they had it all together, asking people to do things they themselves couldn't do. The definition of hypocrisy. Jesus says, be careful, watch out, be on guard, watch out for hypocrisies. And he gives the analogy of that of leaven, because of just you, all you need is a little bit of leaven to make the dough or the, the yeast to, in the dough to rise. And so just a little bit of hypocrisy in our lives is enough to ruin us. Beware, be careful of hypocrisy. You know, I believe that the world is looking for a church that has its lamps on and ready for their, their Savior coming. I believe that the world is looking for, for a church that is not going to be hypocritical, pointing the finger at them when you have four fingers pointing back at you. 
I believe that the world is looking for a church and Jesus was preparing us for this hour and day in which we would be living. It's like never before. Secondly, the second warning that he gives quickly in Luke chapter 12 is to beware of covetousness. Beware of of not having enough. Beware of looking at what your neighbor has and wanting your neighbor's goods. That's the definition of covetousness. And he gives us the example of the rich fool who said to himself, you know what, I have so much, let me tear down my barns and build bigger barns. And, and at this time, let me eat, be merry, and, and live a good life. And we know how that Jesus said that at that very hour, you fool, because you don't know the day or the hour. You don't know, you're not promised tomorrow if you're going to have another day to live. And who's going to receive all the goods that you have stored up? Let us not be rich towards ourselves, but let us be rich towards God. Because God is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Amen? Thirdly, He says, beware of worry. You know, one of the biggest sins in our lives is the sin of worry. We, we say we're being cautious. <laughs> We give excuses for our worry. But worry is really a distrust. It is a lack of faith. And it is a sin that will destroy our lives. Worry prevents us from growing in the things of God. Worry is not a fruit of the Spirit. Come on. It is a work of the flesh. To worry is to say that we have to find the way or that we are the source rather than God being our source and our supply. And worry smacks in the face of the faith that God has given to us to be overcomers in this world. As a matter of fact, if you want to have the right picture, the word actually means in the original to choke or to strangle. Remember when Jesus talked about the four types of soil, that there was those that the seed, the good seed was scattered amongst, that for a season it sprung up, but then it was choked by so many worries and cares of life. Be on guard, dear beloved ones, against worry. Amen? What is our weapon against worry? It is the Word of God. What has God said? He, he is who He says He is. Amen? He's a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Hallelujah. Every good and every perfect gift comes from the Father above, in whom there is no variableness nor shadow of turning. We can have faith in this hour. Amen? If you're not looking to your, to your own reasoning, but if you look to the Word of God, you can overcome worry. Praise God. And fourthly, this morning, Jesus gives the warning about being careless. It's a warning that encompasses the passages of Scripture that we just read here, and it's the parable of the faithful and the unfaithful servant. And so we have this parable picture for us. And verse 35, let me draw your attention here back to this passage of Scripture. There are three things, three levels of preparation that God wants for every servant of God this morning. And number one, the first level of preparation is to have your loins girded. And you know, isn't it interesting that that, uh, Paul talks about the armor of God and there is this belt called truth that is also a part of the armor of God. Isn't it interesting here that the first level of preparation is your preparation of readiness to be girded with the truth. Amen? You know, what a mind picture we see here of a servant in that day or a slave who served in the household. Jesus is looking for that one whose master has gone out to the wedding but that is going to be returning. This is the servant here that Jesus is talking about. The one who has girded himself and is ready for action. You know, I believe that the the thing that the enemy loves the most is that he he can discourage us to not take any action. That we we would believe the lie that, you know what, I don't have to serve the Lord anymore. I don't really have to strive in serving Him or working hard for Him. Somebody else will do it. I'm not as gifted, and we make our excuses, and they sound so religious, and they sound so right, but Jesus is looking to that heart that is perfect towards him today. Every servant to be girded and prepared at a moment's notice, I'm ready for action. 
When God says move, I'm ready to move. When God says go, I'm ready to go. I'm not sitting by waiting, counting the tulips and, and waiting as the days go by. I'm ready for action. When the Lord said he's coming, are you ready? It is that kind of level of attention that God is saying. He not only was saying to the crowd then in that day, but he's also saying to us today, are you also ready? Like those who wait for their master. What a picture. And so the master has gone off to get married, and so he's going to be returning. And the master is having a great time, and maybe he gets caught up in conversation. But the wise steward or the wise servant or the wise slave that is at home knows that some moment the master is going to come. In order to be prepared, I need to have a lamp out. I need to keep a watch out because there were no street lamps in those days. In order to know that there was activity at home, someone would keep a, a lamp burning by the window and any passerby would know that there was somebody up watching in that hour. You know, today we have ring on our doorstep. The Apple ring, you know, that, that doorbell with the, with the camera there. And so this is the way, we, we have heat sensors and we have motion detectors. But in those days, they only had lamps. And so a lamp was a signal to the outsider that somebody is up and he's watching in the house. So thief, beware. Someone's on watch. In those days in the cities, they would set watchmen upon the walls and they would have torches and lamps there on the walls as a signal to the outsiders when the gates were closed at night that there was a watchman on the wall looking in case the enemy would come. He would grab that bell and begin to sound the alarm that there was an invasion coming. It's that level of preparation that Jesus is talking about for those like those men who are ready for their master so that when the master would come, they would be ready to open the door and to receive him. Look again what it says here in verse 36. And you yourselves be like men who wait for the master that when he will return from the wedding and comes and knocks may open immediately. You know, I pray that our hearts are open to receive from the Lord everything that he has for us. Amen? And what is the symbol of the lamp burning but the truth of God? The truth of God. We, we're reminded again and again that the, the God's word is like a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. This word is the only thing that can penetrate the darkness. It's amazing how one light has the ability to pierce through the darkness. You know, we're going to be going camping soon with the boys ministry and the girls ministry. And one of the things that, one of the memories I, I have so vividly in my mind as a young boy was when we would go camping with my dad and we would take our canoe out for a night excursion, sometimes at midnight, because it was then at those hours of, of the morning that the sky was in its fullness of its glory. But how would we find our way back to shore? How would we find the way home? We would keep a lamp burning on the shore. It's amazing that no matter how far out in the water we could go, that light, that single light would be burning there, guiding us, reminding us where our fixed position of home was. So like the Word of God, as we just heard about with the JBQ, when God's Word is stored like a treasure in our hearts, it is like a lamp that is burning, that is shining, so that we know the way that God has for us. Keep your lamps not only burning, but keep oil in the lamps. Keep those lamps trimmed and ready. We also see here that there was a third level of preparation, and that involved the human element that involved the servant's attention to be watching and waiting. It's so easy to be lulled to sleep when so many around you are falling asleep. Come on. It is so easy to get comfortable where we are at in our Christian walk. It is so easy to think that we've got time. My friends, the Bible says we don't have the time. As a matter of fact, every day that, that passes by is a day closer to Christ's coming and his return. Now there's a special blessing. Look at the blessing. I, I love how it says this in verse 37. It says in the New King James, Blessed are those servants whom the master when he comes finds watching. In the NIV it says it three times. It will be good for those servants whom the master finds watching. He says it three times in verse 37. 38 and 43. But there's a special blessing to those that watch. And would you notice with me what that blessing is? 
For when that master comes, verse 37, and, and I will say that he will gird himself, should he come in the second watch? Now those watches, the, in those days, the, the Roman world, the, the night was divided into three watches. The first watch was from 6 to 9 p.m. The second watch was from 9 p.m. to 12 p.m. And the third watch was from midnight to 3 a.m. And notice what he's saying here. Even if he delays his coming, should it be the second watch or the third watch, it's going to be later than you expect. But blessed are those servants who, who are found watching. Hallelujah. The blessing is this. Look what it says in verse 37. This is the most peculiar thing. It says not only does the master find them watching it says in verse 37, I say to you that he will gird himself. What is this pointing to? Friends, we need to know the story of this book and what the, it says about the last days. There's going to be what we call the marriage supper of the Lamb. When God gathers his church together with all of the saints before us, that there's going to come a celebration in heaven. This is what it's pointed to when it's saying that at that moment, when the master finds them ready, something most peculiar. The master humbles himself. Who could that be talking about but my Jesus? There was only one, the Bible says, that before he went to the cross, that he took off his robe and he began to wash the disciples' feet. What a picture we see here that our Jesus is going to serve us at the wedding celebration. For those that are ready and those who are watching, that's the image in the picture that we have here. The emphasis that we're being reminded of is that this coming is going to come at a time that is expect, unexpected. To be watchful means that we are alert and prepared to not be caught by surprise. You know, in other words, in the armies back in the day when they would go out to, to battle and, and, and they would be living in tents, in other words, when the enemy was, was coming, they were prepared and dressed, ready to go. You wouldn't be caught with your, your pants around your ankles. No, that would, that would be uh, foolish, right? You could not wage a proper battle against the enemy unless you were prepared. And so if the master knew, Jesus illustrates again, that if the master knew that this would be the hour that he would come, he would not have allowed his house to be broken in. And so... There is a blessing to our watchfulness, but how many of you know there are consequences if we're not watchful? This is what Jesus is saying in, in the opposite when he's saying if, if, if the thief was coming to your home tomorrow night at 9 a.m., would you be ready? You would be there with a lamp, probably a torch, right? Not a, not a physical lamp, but maybe a, a, a flashlight, and you would have 911 on speed dial, right? Why? Because you know that the thief is going to try to come and break in your house. But most, most robbers don't announce their coming. They look for those who are unprepared. The robber looks for the house whose lamp has gone dim or has gone out. The, the robber knows that, there's a, that there isn't a watchman that is watching in that house that is dark. Come on, somebody. But those that have the lamp on, they'll pass by. Turn with me to 1 Thessalonians. I believe it's important that we're familiar that there is a day that is coming that the Bible talks about clearly and often. And it's found in 1 Thessalonians. You know, we as the bride of Christ, the only thing that needs to happen right now is the rapture. There is no mention of rapture. If you try to find the word in the scripture, you can't find the word rapture, but it's a Greek word that means to snatch or to get caught up, to snatch away. You won't find the word rapture in scripture, but we understand that there's going to come a moment when Christ is going to come back before his second coming or in Daniel's 70th week. And we read here, it's called the day of the Lord. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 1. But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, 
you have no need that I should write to you. This is Paul now. We're fast forwarding many years later after Jesus gave this parable. Now we have a much more broader and completer picture of what the end days were going to be looking like. But in Jesus' day, when he gave this parable, they had no idea of these things. So Paul is now expanding on this. Verse 2, For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord comes, how? Like a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should not overtake you as a thief. Verse 5 says, You are the sons of light and the sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us what? Watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But let us of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and putting on love as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath. Praise God. Can you say amen? This is the hope that we have. God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we know that there's going to follow the rapture of the church, a period of time that Daniel talks about in Daniel chapter 9, called in the 70th week of, of his revelation, that there's going to be a period on the earth called the Great Tribulation. It's going to last for a seven-year period. It begins at the moment that the church is caught up or snatched away. Because why? The church is not appointed unto wrath, but we have been caught like a servant with our lamps ready at that moment, as 1 Thessalonians 4 says, that with the trump of God, the archangel and the shout of, of God, that in that moment we're going to be caught up in the twinkling of an eye. Can you imagine? Ten one-hundredths of a second and we're going to be there. That in that moment we're going to be caught up and caught away from this earth. Then during those seven years are going to be, as it says in Revelation chapter 6 through 19, it talks about the various judgments or the wrath of God, the bold judgments, the trumpet judgments, and the six seals that God has on that scroll that are going to be opened during that period of time, and God is going to be judging the earth, and those of the Antichrist and those that are against him are going to be punished severely. And then at the end of that seven-year period, he's going to come again. That is called the second coming of Christ, where he comes, as it says in Revelation, riding on a white horse, on that charger, that, that faithful steed, gathering with the armies of heaven behind him to do war against the Antichrist and the devil and to cast him into the bottomless pit for a thousand years. But only if you're ready. Only if you're watchful. Only if you're girded and ready for action. As we look on here in the passage, Jesus goes on to say, as Peter asks, Lord, are you telling this parable to everyone or just to us? Let me ask a very important question to everyone that is here today. I want to ask this question. No, no one looking around. If, if someone was to ask you, do you believe that Jesus is coming? What would you say? Do you really believe that? If you believe that, are you ready? You see, this is the hour for our examination. This is the hour for our preparation. Look with me what it says in verse 42. Who then is a faithful and a wise servant? Jesus continues. He doesn't really give Peter the answer he's looking for, but he launches right into this parable. Who then is a faithful and and a wise servant. We see that a, way, a faithful and a wise servant is one, as we've already talked about, who is watching and waiting. There's a level of preparedness. But as we're going to soon learn, this is not all that God requires of his servant. 
God doesn't just need us to be watchful, and he doesn't just need us to be waiting, but we'll see here that there's a third requirement that God has for a faithful servant, and that is that we are to be found working or serving. This does not contradict what we know in Scripture. Our salvation is not produced because of works, but it is an evidence of saving grace that out of the outflow of our hearts, to serve Christ in his kingdom, we work for the Lord. We serve the kingdom of God. We serve one another. We serve God in his kingdom. And each one of us, as members of the body, have a part to play. Amen? Every one of us, as Paul gives us this beautiful analogy, there are many members of the body that work together, and everyone is needed to support the whole body. The eye can't say to the foot, I have no need of you. Every part who works has value and adds value to all the rest. This is the part that Jesus is reminding us. It's not just about watching and waiting, but I want to tell you today, every one of us here has a work to do for the Lord. I said every one of us has a work to do for the Lord. There is an area that God has us to serve. And the, we see here that Jesus gives further commendation to, in verse 43, he says, blessed again. This is the second time he says it. It is good for that servant whom his master will find working when he comes. Now here's where I want to give you a very clear and prominent picture that this is different than the way that most of us live our lives. That the way that we are called to work for Christ is a lot different than the way that many of us have our focus or our goals in life. You see, for many people, their goal in life is to focus on how much or how little that they have. That is not the goal that Jesus is referring to here. We look at that, that based on how much we have or how little that we have, that we say that this is the measure of a person's success. Do you know that doesn't mean anything to Christ? How much? or how little you have. The Bible says he's no respecter of person. It doesn't mean a thing to God how many houses or how much you have in your bank account or how many cars you have or how much clothes you have. It doesn't matter to God. Those things don't mean anything, but they mean a lot to us, let's be honest. Because so many in this world are going after these things as if those are the most important things that there could be in life. I pray that we would have a different goal. I pray that we would have a different perspective. You see, oftentimes, even in Christian circles, the focus becomes about what we can achieve or how well we can perform. And none of these things matter to God. Can I just be honest with you? There's only one thing that's going to matter to Him in the end. And it's not going to be about your performance or how successful or, you know, some of us are even seated here today and we can say in our Christian walk, you might be frustrated at this moment. I don't feel that I could achieve what others have achieved. I don't feel as that I'm as, as smart as or I'm as good as and the list can go on and on. Be careful of those comparisons because measuring up against ourselves against others is not wise and it hinders our growth. What is most important for a true servant of God is that we are faithful. That means that we remain until the end. That, there's a word, it's called persevering. What matters is not how you start the Christian walk, it matters how you finish it. It doesn't matter as much if you stumble a little bit along the way and fall down. The Bible says a righteous man falls seven times. But what makes him righteous is he doesn't stay down and wallow in self-pity and say, woe is me. But he gets back up again and he reminds himself, there is plenty in my father's house. I'm going to go back and I'm going to return. What matters is that you are faithful at what God has called you to do. No matter how big the work or how small the work is that you remain faithful. Jesus goes on to elaborate about the reward or the lack of reward to every man's work. Blessed is that servant, he says again and again, for truly I say to you that he who he finds so doing will make him a master. Listen to this. He will make him in charge of everything that he has. Kind of reminds you of Joseph in the Bible, doesn't it? 
For a season, he had to work as a servant and as a slave in Potiphar's house. And even there, the enemy tried to take him out of the game like the enemy does to so many men of our generation, the lust of the eye. It gets him every single time. But Joseph left his cloak. He was not going to dishonor. He was not going to disvow his, his, his integrity. He was not going to surrender his integrity to the master for a moment of momentary pleasure. We know that that cost Joseph greatly because then he was cast into prison and he was falsely accused. And we know the story, but there comes a day, hallelujah, that all of those troubles and all of those trials were preparation for the day of appointment and the day of promotion that would come. You've been faithful, my servant, over the little. Now you are going to be entrusted over everything that I have in my kingdom. Only if you're faithful. Only if you persevere. Blessed is that servant. You see, we've been given a commission and we've been given a command to rule and to reign with Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 9 through 16, it, Paul talked about the fire test. That there's going to come in that end, in that hour, that if we are the fellow workers of God and we are God's building, he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 9, but let each, he goes, for we are God's fellow workers, and you are God's field. You are God's building according to the grace which God has given to me. A wise master builder, Paul says, I've laid the foundation and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds. For no other foundation can any man lay which is laid but Christ Jesus. But here's the most revealing truth about this passage, verse 13. Every man's work is going to be known. Every man's work, what he has done, his faithfulness is going to become clear. For that work, what sort it is, is going to be revealed. For everyone's work, which he has built on, if it endures, he will receive a reward. And everyone's work that is burned will suffer loss. But he himself will be saved as yet through fire. There are many examples that I could go on and give you Examples of faithfulness that we see that in spite of life's trials and testings, remember Jacob? Jacob didn't have a good start in life. He lied to his brother. He cheated his brother. He wanted to steal the birthright from his brother. And yet we read in the story that there came a moment when Jacob wrestled with the angel who we believe was Jesus Christ. And he said with determination, I'm not going to let go until you bless me. And through Jacob's perseverance, we find in Scripture that he received a new name and he secured a greater blessing than he ever had in his life. How many remember the story of Joshua and Caleb that when the 12 spies were going to go in to the promised land, that, that those uh, 10 brought forth an evil report, but Joshua and Caleb said, these giants are only grasshoppers for us because with God all things are possible. And unfortunately, the evil report spread through the ranks. But we see that God was faithful to Joshua and Caleb. And the entire generation was killed in the wilderness. But Joshua and Caleb entered the promised land. How many can remember the story of Job? Oh, my goodness. Job had great health. He had a great family. And he had great wealth and great riches. But in the midst of all of this, God stripped all of these things away in testing Job. That even in the midst of Job's trial, these amazing words came out of him mouth, that though he slay me, yet will I trust him. And we see that in the faithfulness of Job, God rewarded him. And the Bible says he became even more prosperous than he was before. God restored his houses. God restored his family. He gave him a new family, and he had even more than he started with. My friends, I want to tell you that well begun is only half done. I said only well begun is only half done. You've got to get to the end. We've got to get to the finish line. Come on. We've got to get to the end of the story. Lord Jesus, help us. Jesus said in Matthew 24 and 13, these are the words of Jesus, he that endures to the end 
is the one that shall be saved. Christ turns his attention from the faithful servant to the unfaithful servant. Notice what he says first. If that servant, verse 46, but if that servant says in his heart, isn't it interesting? The thing that betrays us all is our heart. Why do you think it was so important that in the book of wisdom, Proverbs 4.23 says, above all else, guard your heart. Do you think there's no correlation here? But when that servant said in his heart, he didn't maybe say it that everybody around him heard it, but when he said it in his heart, because as a man thinks in his heart, so he is. That true and wise servant lives to serve his master. A true and wise servant's desire is to please their master and to work for him. But this is the most revealing truth of all, and it's found here. As he goes on in verse 46, the master of that servant will come to him on that day when he is not looking for him and at an hour when he is not aware. You know, before that, the servant said in his heart, my master is not coming. It's late. It may be the second watch. It may be later than he thought. But his purpose was to be watchful. But in his heart, he said he's not going to be coming. And so we see here what is revealed, that there was a sloppiness, there was, a, there was a, a lack of concern. And isn't it important here to understand that in that moment he began to treat and mistreat, he began to mistreat what he once loved. Because of the master was delaying, he begins to mistreat his house guests, he begins to mistreat the other servants. He doesn't show them proper love. He literally, in the, in the passage, says he begins to beat them. You know, we can beat people physically, but we can also beat them up with our words. We can be very unkind sometimes with our words and how we treat others. We think that we can get away with it, but this is what that servant thought. He began to mistreat. He didn't show proper love. He didn't show respect. And his own self, he becomes neglectful. And the love for the things of this world begins to drown his love for his master. And so eating and drinking is a normal part of life, but when it becomes an excess, when it goes beyond the normal uh, amount, he begins to be a snare to him. And he ceases to continue to be as he was before. The love of the world begins to drown out the love of God. And we see that this man begins to lose his own soul. I like how the message says this passage. It says, The servant who knows that the master wants but ignores it, or who instantly does whatever he pleases, will be thoroughly thrashed. Wow, that's a picture. You see, for the unrepentant servant, who knew the master's will but did not prepare himself, shall receive punishment. There's a loss of reward. There's a punishment that comes. It says here in our text, shall be beaten with many stripes. But notice here that our master is not unkind because we're only punished to that which we actually know. So be careful. Be on watch. Be ready. Because the hour is coming where we can do no work. And in that hour, it will be too late to change. The master who knew his master's will but did nothing to prepare himself is punished. And it's a severe punishment. We see that, that, that in that moment, literally, to cut him in two would not be possible in this sense because how would he be divided with the unbelieving? But we would say in our culture, we would give him left and right. You see, for that, un, that master or that servant that was not ready to be uh, received at that moment would be given a thrashing that he would never forget. This is a serious warning for all of us to take serious. If we've been called to a work, we must be found faithful. We must be found watchful. Amen? But there are those among us Sad to say, who even fall away from the truth that we once loved. We call that apostasy or the apostate. One who was a former believer but then turns from the truth and goes back as 
it says, as a dog returns to its own vomit. The apostate. You know, there are more and more people in the church. We just heard even the statistic a while ago there in that JBQ video that 70% or higher of young people when at age of 18 will leave the church never to return. It's sobering. It's serious. You see, no one becomes apostate overnight. It's a slow drift. It's a drifting away. It's the deceitfulness of sin. Yes, there's pleasure in it, but for a season. The deceitfulness of sin says you can do that and still ask God for forgiveness and he'll forgive you. My friends, every time we sin, there's a cost. If that wasn't true, there would never have been the cross of Jesus Christ. Even for us as Christians, there's a cost. There's a loss of reward. There is a, there's a consequence to our sin. Be warned. Be warned and be ready. This is what the Bible is telling us. Be guarded against the hardening of your own heart. And we see this again and again. I was just reading in the one of the uh, online Christian publications. How many of you have ever heard the book, I Kiss Dating Goodbye? It was a very popular book back in the 90s. I Kiss Dating Goodbye by Josh, and I can't think of his last name off the top of my head. I was so troubled when I read this article because it was one of the, the, the a wide-selling book of its day that just publicly he renounced his faith in Jesus because of his own marital failings in his own life. And I'm saying, how sad could a man who once challenged so many others now walk away from the faith? The Bible warns us that in the last days, the love of many is going to grow cold. But we need to be guarded. We need to be prepared. Perilousness can cause great peril. Because as we read in this passage, the master's return comes at an unexpected time. You know, if we become casual with sin, watch out. You may become the next casualty of sin. Don't, don't handle it. Don't touch it. Don't look at it. Don't, don't make excuses for it. I only point it back to the cross of Jesus. There was only one human being, and I say yes, human being, because Jesus was born in the flesh, and therefore he could take the punishment in the flesh upon himself, upon the tree, and only he could take the curse that we deserve for our sins upon himself. It cost him greatly, friends. Notice what our text says, verse 48, to whom much is given, much will be required, and much has been committed of him, and they will ask even more. You might be asking, what is the unforgivable sin? Many give different answers, but I believe that the unforgivable sin is a total rejection of Jesus Christ. A total turning away from him. A total denying his name. A total uh, rejection of his person and what he has to offer. If you reject Jesus, there is salvation in no other. There is no plan B. There is only the cross of Jesus. And it's only through the cross that every servant and every true follower will ever wear the crown. But we also must take up our own cross. That's why 2 Timothy 2.12 says, This is a faithful saying, For if we died with him, we shall also live with him. Come on. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. But if we deny him, he will deny us. But this is the verse of all verses, verse 13. If we are faithless, come on, he remains faithful. Even in our faithlessness, he remains faithful. I want to ask this question one more time. Do you believe Jesus is coming? Then you better get ready. You better be ready because he's going to come at an hour when you do not expect it. 
Take warning today if you're not concerned about his return. Though he has waited a while, each day is one day closer to his return. Even now, daily headlines are showing that his return is very near. Come on. But even if the Lord should delay for more years ahead, for you personally, my life and your life could end tomorrow. You still have to be ready. Are you ready? If not, now is the time to get ready. If you want to have help with how to get ready, it is the prayer of this church it is the heart of this pastor that I would want to do anything and everything that I can to help you to be ready and to be aware and watching. If you don't have a relationship with him, today is the day that you can come to repentance. Now is the time that you can turn your back on your sin and turn to the fullness of his grace. Eternal life is found only in the name of Jesus. Would you bow your hearts and your heads with me in this moment? Jesus, help us to be faithful, Lord. The casualties are piling up, Lord. Soldiers of the cross are becoming rare. Enemies of the cross, Lord, are coming in their full fury. The enemy knows the hour is late. Lord, awaken us. If we are ready, Lord, so many others need to be made ready. And you've called us, Lord God, to go and rescue the perishing. God, give this church a burden for the souls. Give the leadership of this church, Lord, a burden for souls. That, Lord, you keep us up at night because there are people in our own families that will die and go to hell because they don't know you and they don't love you. And they've never had the opportunity to hear that you died for them, but you didn't stay dead, but you rose for them. And you now live to intercede for them so that one day you, you would be reunited with us in heaven forever. God, the hope of many Christians' hearts has become cold because their lamps are no longer burning, by God. We don't watch in the word we don't pray like we should we don't listen to the promptings of the spirit anymore we've grown cold inside let the love of Jesus begin to woo us afresh and anew today let the compassions of the Lord awaken a new a new hope within the church Lord may we be concerned that God we're not promised tomorrow but we must live for today Today is the day of salvation. God, I pray that every person's heart here today, though you see it, O oh God, we don't. God, you know every thought and every intent of our hearts. They are laid open before you. There's no disguise in heaven. Father, I pray that our hearts would be ready. Help us, Jesus, to be ready. Help us, O oh Lord God, to to take serious the commands of Jesus. These are imperative commands, O oh God. Heaven and earth is going to pass away, but your word is going to endure forever. Lord, like the psalmist, may we declare again, let the word of God come and be lit like a fire shut up within our very bones, O oh God. You have put eternity in our hearts, Ecclesiastes 3.11 tells us. 
God, may we hunger and thirst for your righteousness once again. Let the lamp of your truth, O God, be shining ever brightly, God. To whomsoever will call upon the name of the Lord, the Bible says, they too can be saved. I want to give ample opportunity for each of us today to come full circle. If we've never put your faith or trust in Jesus, today is your opportunity. I want to give you opportunity. There are many people today that are here who are guests, who are visiting with us, and, and, and God saw fit that you would be here today to hear this word. God is talking to you, my friend. He knows what you're struggling with. He knows the thoughts of your heart. But he's also made a way for you, and he has a way of escape. He has brought Jesus to be the, to be the healer and the restorer of your life. Put your faith and trust in Christ today. He's the only one that can save you. He's the only one that can wash your heart clean. Is there anyone here today? Just put your hand up and put it down. I want to give ample opportunity to everyone today to receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Praise God for your faithfulness. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to life in Him. Thank you, Jesus, for the hearts that are pure and clean and prepared, O oh God but for the rest of your bride, your church, it's time to gird her loins, to pick up the torch of God. It is time to fill your lamps with oil. It is time to trim the wick of your devotion and your love for Jesus that it would burn brighter than it ever has before. God, pierce the darkness with the light of your truth. Pierce the lamp of our hearts, O oh God, here today. For all of us, O oh God, we need to come that same way. We all need to, Lord, prepare our hearts to come to Christ. Thank you, Jesus, for your amazing love and your amazing grace. Prepare in us, O oh God, a way, Lord, that our hearts would be transformed and renewed in the power of your might. How many of God's servants today need to be renewed in the power of his might? How many of God's servants today are willing to say, you know, Lord, I need to be filled with fresh oil. My lamp, Lord, is growing a little dim, but I need, I need a fresh touch of the Holy Spirit. If that's your heart, I'm just going to ask you to stand in these next few moments. We're going to seek the Lord together today. The Bible says we do not have if we do not ask. So let's ask in faith today that God would kindle a fresh love, a fresh fire, a fresh anointing in our souls. God, put a love in our hearts for your word. God, give us back that devotion, that love for the lost. Lord, if that lamp for, for of love has gone dim, Father, I pray that you would awaken it in the mighty name of Jesus. How many of us today, Lord, myself included, Lord, I'm praying this prayer this morning. Revive us again, O oh Lord. Revive us again. Lord, revive us because your return is coming at an hour when we do not expect. Lord, sharpen us. Prepare us, Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Those of you that are standing, I'm going to invite anyone else to stand with us in concluding prayer. You need a touch from heaven this morning. You need a fresh touch of God. Would you join us in standing this morning? And let's reach our hands towards heaven. Father, we thank you for your grace. Thank you, Lord, for your anointing, O oh God. It breaks the yokes. It breaks the chains. It breaks the powers, O oh God. God, the very fact that we're standing here this morning is a fact that testifies of your love for us, that you're not willing that any one of us should perish, O oh God that you want us to come to a full understanding of your love and of your grace. God, we raise our hands to you and we ask that you would forgive us of our trespasses, O oh God. Blot out our transgressions, O oh God. God, forgive us, O oh God, of becoming complacent, O oh God. 
Take away the complacency, Lord, God, out of our hearts, that we may follow you, Lord, with loins that are girded with your truth, O God. Father, may our garments be tucked into our belts, O God, and ready. God, let our lamps be burning now, O God. I pray that the Spirit of the living God would give his church fresh oil, fresh oil for their lamps, O God, a fresh joy, a fresh peace, a fresh longing in their hearts for you, Jesus. Come and fill us, Lord. That's the cry of our hearts. Come now, Lord, we pray, and fill our lamps with your light and your love, Jesus. Transform us, O God, and renew our hearts and minds. Oh, God, for that one who came in today without the assurance of faith, Lord, to anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord, the word says they shall be saved. Father, if we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus is raised from the dead, he will quicken our mortal bodies. And if that same spirit that raised up Jesus from the grave dwells in you, he that dwells in you will quicken your mortal bodies. You'll be renewed. The spirit within you shall come alive in Jesus' name. God, let spiritual eyes and ears be open in Jesus' name. May we receive of your fullness and of your grace, for we pray this in the strong and wonderful name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. Hallelujah. Give the Lord a praise this morning. Jesus. Jesus. There's just something about that name when we call upon the name of the Lord. There's something about the name of Jesus. There's power in it, church. There's power in the name of Jesus. Let's come. Let's come to the altar.